Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this Sunday morning. My name is the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. Each week since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic last year, our congregation has gathered together at least twice. On Thursday night, when we tend to our community and each other directly on Zoom, and in this service on Sunday morning, broadcast on YouTube. And Sunday morning, whether in person or on YouTube, is a chance to proclaim who we are and what we're about, throwing open the doors of the congregation and proclaiming the radical love and welcome that is at the heart of our faith. The Unitarian Church of Lincoln, we say, aspires to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and the world. And right now, in what we hope, what we believe are the closing months of this pandemic, we know that transformation is necessary, that we cannot go back to the world as it was. Arundhati Roy wrote at the start of this pandemic that historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging all that we have, or we can walk through lightly, with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and to fight for it. What other world will we imagine? How will we bring it into being? Step lightly and with little luggage, be beloveds, there is still much work to be done. As we light our chalice this morning, we do so with words of the Reverend Hope Johnson, a dear friend who passed away this last year. She wrote, We are one, a diverse group of proudly kindred spirits, here not by coincidence, but because we choose to journey together learning to love our neighbors, learning to love ourselves, apologizing and forgiving with humility, being forgiven through grace, creating the beloved community together, we are one. In his memoir, Walking with the Wind, the late Congressman John Lewis shared a story from his childhood, and it went something like this. About 15 of us children were outside my Aunt Senebus' house, playing in her dirt yard. The sky began clouding over. The wind started picking up, lightning flashed far off in the distance, and suddenly I wasn't thinking about playing anymore. I was terrified. Aunt Seneva was the only adult around, and as the sky blackened and the wind grew stronger, she herded us all inside. Her house was not the biggest place around, and it seemed even smaller with so many children squeezed in, small and surprisingly quiet. All of the shouting and laughter that had been going on earlier outside had stopped. The wind was howling now, and the house was starting to shake. We were scared, and even Aunt Seneva was scared. And then it got worse. Now the house was beginning to sway. The wood plank flooring beneath us began to bend, and then a corner of the room started lifting up. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. None of us could. The storm was actually pulling the house toward the sky with us inside it. And that was when Aunt Seneva told us to clasp hands, line up and hold hands, she said, and we did just as we were told. Then she had us walk as a group toward the corner of the room that was rising. From the kitchen to the front of the house, we walked, the wind screaming outside, sheets of rain beating on the tin roof. Then we walked back in the other direction as another end of the house began to lift. And so it went back and forth, 15 children walking with the wind, holding that trembling house down with the weight of our small bodies. More than half a century has passed since that day. And it has struck me more than once over those many years that our society is not unlike the children in that house, 
rocked again and again by the winds of one storm or another, the walls around us seeming at times as if they might fly apart. It seemed that way in the 1960s, at the height of the civil rights movement, when America itself felt as if it might burst at the seams. So much tension and so many storms. But the people of conscience never left the house. They never ran away. They stayed. They came together and they did the best they could, clasping hands and moving toward the corner of the house that was the weakest. And then another corner would lift and we would go there. And eventually, inevitably, the storm would settle and the house would still stand. And we knew another storm would come and we would have to do it all over again. And we did. And we still do. All of us, you and I, children holding hands, walking with the wind. And that's the end of our story. Each week we take up a collection to support this congregation and our partners in the wider community. We do this because we each gain from being a part of this community in many different ways, and we each give back to this community in many different ways, and contributions of time, of talent, and of treasure. If you'd like to give this morning, the easiest way to do that is simply to text UC Lincoln and the amount you wish to give to 73256. As this next song plays, again, you can text UC Lincoln and the amount you wish to give to 73256. Thank you for your generosity. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. When I breathe in, things that we've been doing as part of our um, pandemic life as a congregation since March is that I've been posting daily video updates every day, Monday through Friday, on the church's YouTube page. We're up over something like 225 now, and, and uh, it's become a really interesting discipline for me uh, to generate ideas for, for what that is. Over this last week, we've been posting readings about what the beloved community is as the, the daily updates as we begin this new theme. And so the readings from today's worship service are taken directly from those daily updates. So you'll actually see me introduce at the beginning, this is the daily update for Wednesday, February 3rd. Um, but if you haven't... Um, stopped by to, to see those updates in a little while, uh, we're still doing them. And they're, they're still an exciting part um, of our ministry as the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. Anyway, here's the reading. This is the Unitarian Church of Lincoln's daily video update for Thursday, February 4th, 2021. 
This week we're uh, giving different images of what the beloved community might be, and today's is from the Reverend Victoria Safford. The beloved community, she writes, is not a goal or destination, and it was not any kind of idealistic Christian utopian dream, but instead a way of being, spiritually, politically, economically, emotionally, intellectually. Beloved community is an attitude, an orientation of the heart. It's a disciplined understanding of your own relationship to other people, and it goes by many names. If you are seeking spiritual wholeness, spiritual balance, it's a spiritual discipline. If you are an ethical humanist, it is a deliberate moral stance. It is a daily spiritual, it is a daily practice, a spiritual politics that requires inclusivity, nonviolence, and the hard discipline of radical hospitality. It requires love. It requires agape. Tomorrow, we'll look at some of the documents from Habitat for Humanity and how they describe the beloved community that they are about building. Each week, we set aside time to consider the joys and sorrows of our lives, to share them with the community because sorrow is easier to bear when we are in community, and joy is easier to celebrate. And so as this next song plays, please consider typing your name or the name of somebody that you are holding today in joy or in sorrow. Before the music plays, will you join me in a spirit of prayer or meditation? With these words by the Reverend Lynn Cox. Spirit of life who draws us together in a web of holy relationships, make your presence known with us and in us and among us. Remind us that we are not alone in history. Ignite us with the courage of the living tradition. Remind us that we are not alone in entering the future. Anchor us with patience and perseverance. Remind us that we are not alone in our times of grief and pain. Comfort us with your spirit, manifest in human hands and voices. Remind us that we are not alone in joy and wonder. Inspire us to honor and extend the beauty we find in this world. Divine music of the universe, let our hearts beat in diverse and harmonious rhythms, cooperating with an everlasting dance of love. May we move with the rhythms of peace. May we move with the rhythms of compassion. May we move with the rhythms of justice. Source of stars and planets and water and land, open our hearts to all of our neighbors. Open our souls to a renewal of faith. Open our hands to join together in the work ahead. So may it be, blessed be, and amen. Voice still and small, deep inside all, I hear you call, singing. In storm and rain, sorrow and pain, still will remain, singing. Calming my fears, quenching tears through all the years 
We, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. So reads the proposed text of a potential eighth principle for the Unitarian Universalist Association. Journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community. Our theme in worship for the month of February is beloved community, and I want to start here with the proposal that beloved community should be centered in our faith through an actual addition to our core principles. And unlike some of the other principles which emphasize worth and dignity, interconnectedness, and the democratic process, beloved community is a term that needs some unpacking and that would appear in the, in the principles as a proper noun capitalized. So what is this beloved community that we are building? We talk about it all the time. Here's an excerpt from a message from Susan Frederick Gray last November. There is also inspiring work happening around us and our capacity to create beloved community and our capacity to create beloved community stays constant and strong. Here's me around that same time talking to this congregation. In that moment, talking about 2015, it would have been really easy to throw up your hands and say this work of being a community is a fool's game. If we put in all this work and talk about being the beloved community, we must have hope. A recent invitation from my professional organization put it this way, we hope that this, talking about a new program that they were launching, is an opportunity for you to lay down your burdens for a few moments and be held by this beloved community. So what is this thing that we are simultaneously creating, building up, and participating in? We often think of beloved community as coming to us from the writing and preaching of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, but in his use of beloved community as a theological concept, King was drawing on the work of the early 20th century philosopher Josiah Royce. Reverend Joanna Crawford describes Royce's original conception of the beloved community this way. Royce's philosophy stemmed from what he called loyalty, and by that he meant the practically devoted love of an individual for a community. This is from the problem of Christianity from 1913. For Royce, beloved community was a goal. It was the best of everyone working for the best of all humanity and encompassing all of humanity. It starts with a community loyalty working towards that end, ever expanding the enlargement of the ideal community of the loyal in the direction of identifying that community with all humankind. King took Royce's beloved community and joined it unmistakably with a theology of justice. <laughs> it's a dog nearby. Uh, beloved community is not perfection. We'll just say that now. The best of ever... Just start that over. King took Royce's beloved community and joined it unmistakably with a theology of justice the best of everyone working for the best of all of humanity and encompassing all of humanity. King connected beloved community as an abstract concept to the vision of Theodore Parker, who wrote that the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. The beloved community is the thing that the universe is bending towards a world where justice, equity, and love are at the core of our human experience, where we all have allegiance to the whole of humankind, where we all have loyalty, as Royce put it, to the whole of humankind. For King and many that follow him, then, the beloved community is also a recasting of an ancient religious idea, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. In Christian theology, the kingdom is both what Jesus is bringing about and what is here with us in this moment. 
It is famously hard to define. Much of the first three Gospels are taken up by Jesus describing in parable and metaphor what the kingdom is like. Parable, the Gospel of Matthew says, to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. And in that same chapter of Matthew, Jesus compares the kingdom of heaven to a man who sowed good seed in his field, to a grain of mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour. It is like treasure hidden in a field. It is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. The kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. And then Jesus stops and asks his disciples, have you understood all these things, Matthew writes? And they said to him, yes. And for 2,000 years, we've been trying to figure out what he meant by all of those things. The kingdom is Jesus' shorthand for his conception of what the world will be like in the fullness of time. The, the kingdom of heaven is the promised land. It is heaven on earth. It's the, the culmination of the spiritual project of the Gospels. It is also right here and right now. The kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed, Jesus says in the Gospel of Luke. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is. For in fact, the kingdom of God is among you. The beloved community then is a kind of broader, potentially humanist reading of the kingdom that Jesus speaks of through his ministry. The beloved community is also the promised land, heaven and earth, heaven on earth, the spiritual project of King's ministry. It is also our project. This is the thing that we are working towards in Unitarian Universalist congregations, in both word and deed, the aim point of the moral arc of the universe. And there are two critical differences between the kingdom and the beloved community. While the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is explicitly hierarchical with God at the center and in charge, the beloved community is egalitarian. Second, the kingdom of God in Christian theology is brought about by Jesus' coming and return, while the beloved community, in our conception of it, is built, at least in part, by our actions here and now. The beloved community is the goal and the thing that we participate in right here and right now. And now I need to go take care of an over-anxious Labrador, so I'll be back in a few minutes.
This is the daily video update for the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. Today is Friday, February 5th, 2021. I'm the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. This week we're reading different images of the beloved community in uh, preparation for a sermon on Sunday about what the beloved community is for our congregation and what it might be calling us to be. And this last image is uh, is straight off of the Habitat for Humanity website as they're describing who they are and what they're about. And they write this. Habitat for Humanity is propelled by a vision of a world where everyone has a decent place to live. We devote ourselves to creating that world because we believe everyone, every single one of us, regardless of who we are or where we come from, deserve a decent life and deserves the opportunity for a better future. Believing is not enough, so we build. We build houses, and through those houses, the strength, stability, and self-reliance that families need in order to achieve a better life. That better life is our primary goal. So when we build houses, we also build bridges between people of diverse backgrounds. We build paths to more connected communities. We build ways for all people to come together and share in the creation of a new world. That new world allows access, equality, and opportunity for all. That new world represents what Dr. Martin Luther King called the beloved community. The beloved community is fair. The beloved community is just. The beloved community is built on love. Not just any love, but as Dr. King said, the love of God operating in the human heart. That's a practical love that requires participation. When that love is truly and fully present, it compels us to act. During a brief correspondence in the 1950s, Dr. King wrote to Clarence Jordan, Habitat's founder, noting the struggles that Clarence's farm faced from hostile and unwelcoming neighbors. I hope that you will gain some consolation, King wrote, from the fact that in your struggle for freedom and a true Christian community, you have cosmic companionship. God grant that this tragic midnight of man's inhumanity to man will soon pass and the bright daybreak of freedom and brotherhood will come into being. We still await that daybreak. While much has been done, so much more work remains. This will never be a world of equality or fairness or human decency that leaves no room for poverty, prejudice, or violence unless we build it. Bold actions speak louder than words. Working together side by side is what will continue to move us from tragic midnight to glorious morning. As Dr. King so powerfully stated, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. With his emphasis on the beloved community, Dr. King gave us the blueprint. Folks of faith and perseverance like Clarence Jordan have stewarded and advanced it. Now it's up to all of us to make it a reality. See you on Sunday. About five weeks ago at the start of the year, I started training to run a half marathon, which is an aspirational goal, shall we say, for a person of my age, fitness, endurance, and uh, and running speed, if we can call it that. But exercise has been an important part of my life during the pandemic, and we moved to upstate New York temporarily. As it turns out, running shoes are a lot easier to transport than a barbell, so here we are. The thing about big goals is that they are made up of a whole bunch of tiny goals. Any training plan is made up of parts. You don't just, say, run a half marathon or run for office on a whim. For me, this is concrete right now. I have no idea if I'm able to run 13.1 miles right now, probably not. But I'm pretty sure that the plan that's printed out on my desk says that today's run, after I'm done recording the sermon, is a 40-minute recovery run, and that tomorrow is a tempo run. The goal, then, in my day-to-day life is actually not to run a half marathon. The goal is to do the workout I've committed to today, to get that thing done. And tomorrow, the goal will be the tempo run. And if you add up enough todays, then the big goal happens. The beloved community is like this, I think. It is actually too much 
for me, to hold the goal of a world without hatred, without need, defined by love encompassing all of humanity. I can, at my best, sometimes, imagine a single country with a slightly more equi equitable healthcare system. But even if I can't grasp that whole thing at once, what I can do is hold some of the steps that take us from here to there, some of the days along the way to the big goal. And the church is a big part of that. In a lot of writing about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, the institutional church with a capital C is, is defined as a sign and foretaste of the kingdom. By participating in the church, this argument goes, believers have a foretaste, an appetizer, quite literally, of the kingdom, while serving as a sign to point the world in the direction of the kingdom. What would it mean for us to be a sign and foretaste of the beloved community in this place? Now, to be clear, the Unitarian Church of Lincoln is not the beloved community. It is possible, on our best days, that we are a beloved community, that we practice beloved community, that we practice being a sign and foretaste of the eventual big goal. But there are some concrete goals between here and there that we can engage with to practice being a beloved community and bringing it about. Pieces like the adoption of an eighth principle. If, as Royce puts it, the beloved community is the best of everyone working for the best of all humanity and encompassing all of humanity, then a very concrete piece of practicing this vision is asking of our communities who is welcome here. Unitarian Universalist theologians Alex Capitan and Reverend Michael Slack describe the beloved community in our congregations this way. Beloved community for me is when we say we, and we mean everyone. Beloved community is not homogenous, can't be. When commonality is presumed, when we make assumptions about whose presence and whether people are like us or not, we're not practicing beloved community. Because beloved community doesn't make those assumptions. It doesn't presume commonality or a sense of being homogenous. Next week on uh, Valentine's Day, Reverend Sarah Skachko is going to join us preaching about Rebecca Solnit's book, A Paradise Built in Hell, and how, contrary to the stories that often get told, it is in times of adversity and shared suffering that beloved community often arises. After that, though, as this month goes on, we're going to take two Sundays to talk about programs that we are taking part of as a congregation to both build the beloved community in the world and be and practice being a beloved community among us gathered here. Since last fall, over 40 of our members have participated in a program called Beloved Conversations through the Unitarian Universalist Meadville Lombard Theological School. Beloved Conversations is an opportunity to engage in dialogue and deep introspection around race, unpacking what it means to be conscious of the systems of white supremacy and oppression that surround us, and that many of us participate in, however unknowing or unwillingly. On February 21st, two weeks from now, we'll hear from participants in Beloved Conversations on what the experience this fall has meant to them, and what we might learn as a community from engaging together in this work as the program continues in the spring. The next week, February 28th, we'll spend Sunday talking about the UUA's five pillars of welcome. The LGBTQIA committee is leading an effort this year to update our congregation's welcoming certification through the UUA. And while that sounds like a relatively dry process of recertification, the questions that it raises are profound. How are we present to each other and the community? 
Are we a place where, as Alex Capitan and Casey Slack put it, our commonality is presumed when we make assumptions about who's present and whether people are like us or not? Beloved con community is a marathon. It's the big goal, the one that I don't think I will see in its full glory, at least not in this lifetime. But big goals are made up of a lot of little tasks. And those we can see. Those we can do. And each time we do, we're participating in something larger than we can imagine. May it be so. And amen. Our closing words this morning are from the Bishop Ken in tenor for Oscar Romero. We've used these in worship before, but it's been a while and I could not think of a better way to summarize this work of being the beloved community together. It helps now and then to step back and take a long view. The kingdom is not only beyond our efforts, it is beyond our vision. We accomplish in our lifetime only a fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is God's work. Nothing we do is complete, which is another way of saying that the kingdom always lies beyond us. No statement says all that could be said. No prayer fully expresses our faith. No confession brings perfection. No pastoral visit brings wholeness. No program achieves the church's mission. No set of goals and objectives include everything. This is what we're about. We plant the seeds that one day will grow. We water the seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. We provide yeast that produces effects far beyond our capabilities. We cannot do everything, and there is a sense of liberation in realizing this. This, is, this enables us to do something, and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter and do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are workers, not master builders. Ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future, not our own. Amen, and see you next week.